Yeah, thanks. Um, it's a great pleasure to be down under. Thanks for the invitation. Today, um, I will be speaking about quantum Gibbs samplers. Now, a little comment to the computer scientists and mathematicians in the room. Uh, don't think of a sampling algorithm. This is more about preparing the Gibbs state on a quantum computer or in nature. And Gibbs state is just a thermal state, the typical the state that a, a system will be represented by when it's in thermal equilibrium. And this is work uh, in collaboration with Fernando Brandao. So as we heard from our uh, experimentalist this morning, uh, it's strongly believed now that simulations are the way to go in terms of practical quantum information uh, processing. And we also know that in nat nature tends to uh, want to go to thermal equilibrium. So it's likely that the, so the um, algorithms that are going to be mo uh, some of the most useful are the ones that simulate thermal systems. And this is uh, one motivation uh, of, the, of the talk today. That is uh, to say something about how efficiently you can prepare thermal states on a quantum computer. But the other motivation is actually to analyze uh, how nature prepares thermal states. And we'll see that there's a very intimate connection between these two. So if you don't retain anything else from the talk, this is what you have to retain, is that the rate of convergence of your algorithm or uh, that takes you to the Gibbs state, to, ther to uh, your thermal state, is going to be very intimately related with the correlations within this Gibbs state. In particular, what, we, what I'm going to show is that if the rate of convergence is rapid, then correlations can't build up in your system. And vice versa, if you have uh, exponentially decaying correlations, so very few correlations between distant observables in your system, then it implies that these constructed Gibbs samplers, these constructed algorithms will converge rapidly. So here's the setting. We consider a lattice, a uh, finite lattice for convenience. We assume that the local dimension is finite, and I draw a square lattice, but of course these, these results hold for more general lattices. Um, and Throughout, you probably want to think of classically the Ising model or quantum mechanically the, um, the toric code, although these results hold much more generally. Very importantly, and that's the title of the talk, I'm only going to be considering commuting Hamiltonians, meaning a Hamiltonian which is, can be written uh, with local terms that commute, to represent the local terms with little uh, green bubbles. And what will be important or the remainder of the talk is that when I talk about a subset of the lattice, um, you always have to keep in mind that I'm going to talk about the inner subset and that there are always going to be terms of the Hamiltonians and of the, of the uh, Gibbs sampler that are going to be sticking out from the subset. Uh, the states we'll be interested in are Gibbs states. And the mathematical framework for all of this is non-commutative LP spaces. It's a very fancy way of saying that we'll work with a, an inner product which is weighted by the Gibbs state and the norm which is also weighted by the Gibbs state. These non-commutative uh, LP spaces have nice properties instead of like triangle inequality, Hilda's inequality, uh, and, they, and they seem to be the right framework for analyzing these problems. <coughs> okay. So in particular, I'm going to say that a Gibbs sampler is a primitive semi, uh, primitive semi group which takes you to the Gibbs state. And in particular, the Gibbs state is the only stationary state of this, uh, of this semi group. A semi group is another way of saying that um, uh, master equation in quantum optics. So I'm going to introduce two uh, different types of Gibbs samplers. The first is uh, inspired more by what actually happens in nature. And this uh, often goes under the name of uh, Davies generator. And you obtain this by considering a system weakly interacting with a thermal bath, a very large thermal bath, and you assume uh, the Mo born markov approximation, meaning the dynamics in the bath are much more rapid than in the system. <coughs> Once you do this, you end up with a uh, master equation of a generator of, uh, of a semi-group, which has all sorts of uh, ugly terms that you don't have to pay too, too much attention to. Um, but it's worth mentioning that these are properly defined for a subset of the lattice we're interested in. This object has to do with the bath autocorrelation function. 
uh, and these are the jump operators. And physically, what these jump operators do is that they jump, uh, they perform jumps between eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. And uh, you jump to an eigen, you more likely jump to eigenstates of low energy than high energy, and this ratio is given by the Gibbs ratio, the, the Boltzmann ratio. So the property of this Gibbs uh, sampler is that it's the generator of a completely positive semigroup. It is local. What that means is that these jump operators only have support on a few, on a few lattice sites, so on a finite number of lattice sites that don't grow with the system size in particular. Uh, they have the same locality as the Hamiltonian, meaning these S have the same range as the Hamiltonian. Uh, and now the less trivial property is that they're going to be locally reversible. Uh, classic literature goes under the name of detailed balance. For people interested in Hamiltonian complexity, this is very closely related to frustration freedom of Hamiltonians. Uh, in, in particular, this condition itself guarantees that rho, the Gibbs state, is going to be the stationary state of your system. The second class of Gibbs samplers is a bit closer to uh, simulation, and I'll go over it very quickly. Uh, the way you can interpret it is that it locally projects onto the Gibbs state. So these E operators that we call conditional expectations are going to be local uh, projectors onto the Gibbs state. Uh, and one of the nice things about these is that they only depend upon the state. So in principle, you could also uh, project onto general mixed states in this manner. Although for general mixed states, you don't have any guarantees in the locality. What's nice about this construction is that if you're dealing with the Gibbs state of a commuting Hamiltonian, then you're guaranteed that this map is also local and has all the same properties as, as the Davies map. Okay. Now, in the, uh, in the theorem, on the one hand, we talk about dynamics and time, and on the other hand, uh, correlations in space. Now, dynamics and time, in particular, we want to uh, characterize rapid mixing, so when your semigroup very rapidly uh, converges to the, the Gibbs state. And one way to do this is to uh, talk about the trace norm convergence and a very naive but often the right upper bound you can give um, is in terms of one over the smallest eigenvalue of your stationary state rho and then one over the gap uh, gamma is the gap yes i'm sorry lambda is the gap for gibbs state you can get an easy uh, natural upper bound on this term which goes as an exponential of the volume of the system of the lattice which means that you're guaranteed to be epsilon close to the stationary state in a time which scales uh, as the volume of the system divided by the spectral gap of the, of the generator, of the semigroup, so of the Liouvillean L. What this tells us is that estimating the speed at which you converge to equilibrium basically reduces to estimating the gap. So for now, we're going to consider, we're going to ignore this term and say that your system converges rapidly if it's, if it's gapped. The other side of the theorem is estimating uh, correlations in the stationary state, in the Gibbs state. So here I'm going to introduce a bunch of uh, equations that you shouldn't pay too much attention to, but uh, rather look at the picture. <coughs> so we say that a system uh, satisfies weak clustering if an observable that a support on this bubble is very weakly correlated with an observable which has support on this bubble. And by very weakly correlated, we mean that the covariance between the two observables, f and g, decays exponentially with the distance between f and g. This can be relaxed, but for, now, but for simplicity, we just uh, assume this as our definition. And this is what we'd really like to show as equivalent to rapid mixing, but unfortunately, we're not able to show it. And it's it's more than when I'm able to show that it, it seems really not to be the right equivalence uh, quantum mechanically. It is the right equivalence classically. Um, you might be worried about a different norm here, but this we can also manage. Our definition of strong clustering is quite exotic. You probably have never seen it before, um, and it's not at all obvious why it's related to clustering in the first place, um, but one should understand it uh, in the following way. You have one subset of the lattice, call it A, another subset of the lattice, call it B, and they're overlapping. And what you care is, is, is about the overlap here. So we assume that the overlap is going to be large enough, and the condition that we call strong clustering is that 
if the overlap is large enough, then the correlation between the local projection onto the Gibbs state on sub, uh, subset A compared to the local projection of uh, the Gibbs state on subset B is going to be very, very small. Now, what's relevant here is that we're talking about local projections onto a much larger system. And these maps E, these conditional expectation values, actually have support outside this region. So the complement is not, the complement of AB is not just going to be this region, but it's going to be this region plus all of the outside. So it's highly non-trivial that it might hold. But this is going to be our definition. And we'll see uh, by the end of the talk that, in fact, these two definitions are, are very closely related. Now I'll do a detour back to the classical theory because all of this was in the qu quantum language, but these results have been, have been analyzed in great, great detail in the classical literature for 40 years now. Um, and there's a, a magnificent theory called DLR theory, which states that you can represent a restriction of a Gibbs state on a lattice system to a certain subset A by simply fixing the boundary conditions around A. And this allows you to show extremely strong equivalences. So you can show that this weak clustering uh, is equivalent to the strong clustering we introduced, and it's equivalent to another uh, notion of clustering, which is called local indistinguishability. Uh, and this should be understood as the classical equivalent of local topological order. Importantly, this does not, this, this breaks down in the quantum setting, even when we're dealing with commuting Gibbs states. And that's because you cannot represent the restriction of a, of a Gibbs state, even a commuting one, by simply fixing the boundary conditions. Okay, back to the main theorem. Better way of saying, the more precise way of stating the main theorem is given a Gibbs sampler, which is a constructive, uh, it's, a, it's a constructive construction. If it is gapped, then it satisfies, then the Gibbs state that you're driven to satisfies strong clustering. On the other hand, if you know that your Gibbs state satisfies strong clustering, then it's a guarantee that L is gapped, that the Gibbs sampler is gapped. So how much, how much time do I have left? 15, okay, that's more than I thought. Okay, so and I can give a proof outline. Yeah, so the basic uh, idea behind the proof is that you can decompose the variance on subsets A and B in this simple manner. So you almost have an additive upper bound, but this additive upper bound is modified by a small epsilon term. And the small epsilon term is exactly the term you get in the notion of strong clustering. Once we have this, for simplicity, assume that the dist so W is, is the, diff uh, the, the width of A, WB is the width of B, and we both assume that these are roughly of size L, and we assume the width of the overlap is roughly square root of L. So we start from this expression of the variance, and from the definition of the spectral gap, we can replace, we can upper bound the variance by one over the spectral gap times uh, this term here called the Dirichlet form. We do this for both the B part and the A part. Then we take the minimum of lambda A and lambda B or the maximum of the inverse. And we can represent these two terms which are linear by <coughs> the Dirichlet form of A union B plus the Dirichlet form of A intersection B. And then we're almost done because the spectral gap is simply the supremum over uh, the Dirichlet form divided by the variance. All right, we're left over with this term and, and you get rid of this by performing some sort of an averaging trick that I don't, I don't want to get into the details of. In the end, what we're left with is a relationship between the gap on a system size which is roughly 2L, which is related to the spectral gap on a system size of size L, you perform this iteratively and you can estimate the spectral gap of the entire system in this manner. The proof in the other direction um, has an, a very different flavor and th this, is sort of, this is sort of nifty. Uh, it uses a lot of techniques from, I don't know what to call the field, but uh, of gapped Hamiltonians. 
So it starts with a mapping between Gibbs samplers and frustration-free Hamiltonians, local frustration-free Hamiltonians. So you can represent the stationary state by doubling the system. You can represent the stationary state, which is a mixed state, by a pure state. And you can represent the completely positive map by a Hermitian operator. Actually, it's only similar to a Hermitian operator. In this representation, your conditional expectation becomes a ground state projector. The gap of your Gibbs sampler becomes the gap of some frustration-free Hamiltonian. And the framework you're working in is LP spaces become a uh, framework of Hilbert spaces. And so, in fact, you've by this mapping, you, we have reduced the problem of estimating uh, or analyzing a gapped Gibbs sampler to the problem of analyzing a gapped frustration-free Hamiltonian. And it turns out that the right tool in this setting has already been developed, uh, which is called the detectability lemma. And using this tool, you can quite easily get to an estimate on the projection onto system A and projection onto system B and compare it to the projection on A, U, B. This has essentially already been done. And it turns out to be exactly the expression you need for, um, for strong mixing, for strong clustering. Funnily enough, once all the work has been done, we realize that uh, a very similar expression was developed in 92 by Nachtagel. It's called the um, Martingale condition. It has nothing, very little to do with Martingales, but I picked up that name somehow. Okay, reminder again, the main theorem, L is gapped, then L satisfies str strong clustering. So to conclude, um, I'll give a few applications of this result. So the first application is that in one dimension, things become a lot simpler. And you can actually show that this strong clustering and weak clustering are equivalent. So in one dimension, um, you really get this intuition that the static uh, definition that we had of strong clustering actually is equivalent to the, our standard notion of clustering of correlations. And this has to do with the fact that, um, as I said, these boundary terms in, in the definition of strong clustering are really problematic, but in one dimension, by uh, Schmidt decomposition, you can get rid of these boundary terms quite simply. In fact, uh, more generally, we can show that the Gibbs state of a commuting Hamiltonian can always be efficiently prepared in 1D. And conversely, the Gibbs state will always have uh, exponentially decaying correlations. You might think that this follows directly from a result by Araki, but it doesn't because we're dealing with different norms here. We're dealing with these LP norms. Araki is dealing with infinity norms. And finally, uh, we can also show that uh, above a universal critical temperature, the Gibbs samplers are always gapped. So these are the settings where it's easy to say something. Uh, of course, the interesting settings are <laughs> not these ones oftentimes. For a very good reason, of course. Uh, we know already classically that there are a lot of systems that are non-trivial, so that have several Gibbs states in the thermodynamic unit. So finally, I think I've gone too fast, but I'll give an outlook. Um, I think one, one, of, one of the most interesting questions, so first of all, the, this result is not, it doesn't really give you practical tools for analyzing these problems, but it gives you a lot of intuition of the fundamental uh, physics that's, that's behind these problems. So there really is a connection between the, the dynamics and the statics of your system. And it, I believe it, it's, it's a very nice framework to discuss the problem of topological order at non-zero temperature. In particular, if one were able to show that, um, uh, that in two dimensions, the strong clustering is equal to weak clustering, this would provide a nail in the coffin for uh, quantum memories in two dimensions for any uh, commuting Hamiltonian. Another thing that I haven't mentioned at all, but you can get much tighter bounds on the mixing time. In fact, the classical result is, is much, 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 much stronger than, than what we can show quantum mechanically. It, it says that if you have this very weak form of clustering of correlations, then you get even faster mixing. So we can only show that the system mixes in polynomial time, but classically they can show that it mixes in logarithmic time in the number, in the volume. Um, even stronger than that, they can show that there can't be any intermediate mixing. So either the mixing takes exponential time in the number of particles, or it's logarithmically fast. Uh, and in order to extend this to the quantum regime, one would have to show 
uh, log sub of bounds. And of course, the big <laughs> obvious open question is can we say anything about um, the non commuting case? And, and this, this seems to be just very, 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 very difficult. Um, because everything, all of the, the operators which we had defined and which were well behaved and local become completely non local uh, in the non commuting case. So even beyond, even before we can analyze the speed at which uh, Gibbs sampler in the non-commuting case uh, will converge, we don't even know how to write one down that will take you to the Gibbs state. There is a result called the quantum uh, metropolis algorithm, which is an algorithm on a quantum computer which takes you to an arbitrary Gibbs state, but this is a completely non-local algorithm. So to do this in a local manner is a very big open problem, I think, and uh, one which I encourage people to work on. So thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. So we have a few minutes for uh, questions. So just wait for the mic. Can you just wait for the mic? So it seems to me that when you map the Liouvillean into this uh, quote unquote Hamiltonian, this Hamiltonian is, is actually not Hermitian in general. Um, uh, first of all, is this true? So if you map a Liouvillean onto a, onto so uh, is this based space? on a state operator correspondence or yeah, it's it's based on a state operator correspondence. So the the reason you obtain a ham well, you don't actually obtain a Hamiltonian. You obtain uh, an operator which is similar to a Hermitian operator. So and the reason you get that it's similar to a Hermitian operator is because of this detailed balance condition, because of this reversibility. Um, so why can you still use detectability lemma here? Because you're dealing with a gapped, frustration-free Hamiltonian. In particular, the, because of the, the, the nature of, of the Liouvillean, you also know that the ground state of this gapped Hamiltonian is going to be zero. So it's perfectly set, uh, set up for, for the detectability lemma. Thank you. OK, another question just there. So I just had a question about, you, you made a comment about the detect a derivation in which you use the detectability lemma is somehow equivalent to using the martingale method. Um, could you comment on? No, it's, it's not. That, that, oh. that, no, it's the, it's the other direction of the proof that's okay. equivalent to the martingale method. OK. OK, there's one behind. Uh, I have a very basic question. Uh, does your strong clustering implies uh, long-range order, like a ferromagnet? No. No, it, it precisely implies no long-range order. Right. Then does, it, does your uh, result imply that the ferromagnets are hard to prepare? So what it implies is that if you're in a regime which is going to have several Gibbs states in the thermodynamic limit, then this particular algorithm is not a good one to prepare those states, and nature will not prepare them rapidly. Right? Also, it's, it's worth mentioning that the, um, these Davies generators are often what you model as being the, the dynamics affecting a system which you would like to be a self-correcting quantum memory. Right? So we'd say that if, if these Davies generators mix rapidly, then your system is not a good quantum memory. So in particular, the regime that we're not interested in, that this theorem does not characterize as the one where you're allowed to have self-correcting memories, both classical and quantum. Okay, it's there. I don't see any uh, further questions. So yes, uh, let's uh, thank Mikhail again.